So, okay, just let me know. Well, good morning, everyone. Tomorrow was kind of, yesterday was kind of a strange day because the, uh, we had uh, cleanup, and then uh, they had street preaching. So street preaching is every other week now, uh, and it'll be, it was uh, yesterday, so I guess in two weeks, it'll be two weeks from now, right? Okay, so uh, we'll start putting that on the uh, bulletin so everybody will know that uh, street preaching takes place. And they meet here and then go out there. If, uh, if you can't make it here, uh, it's always going to be at Woodman and Dorothy Lane. So you can be there at, at the time appointed and, and get into it. I'll tell you what, it's a blessing. Uh, I handed out some books, and I gave Brother Jonathan about five or six extra ones. Uh, the Street Preacher's Manual by Sutek. And that, that book tells you all the little ins and outs about street preaching. And it is just as much as a ministry as it is right now. If you think you should be a pastor of a church, Go out there and street preach for a while. That'll tell you whether you are or aren't. Uh, if you can put up with what is going to happen to you on that street, you can put up with a crowd any day of the week. Uh, it is, it's an amazing thing, and uh, I think everybody should do it. I do it. I used to do it all the time. Dr. Ruttman, in school down there, they made us every Saturday. We had to go street preaching uh, from May. It's like May, April, May sometime till uh, August, September. The, the window was open. After that, he wouldn't let you street preach in Pensacola. If you did, he'd kick you out of Bible college. And so he made a deal with the city because the city got all crazy because we'd street preach all the time. I mean, he had street preachers all over that city. And uh, they, they stopped us. Uh, he, and he said, look, he said, I made a deal with the city, and this is the, the round. If you want to street preach, go to Fort Walton, go to Mobile, go anywhere you want to go, but not here in Pensacola. But I'm telling you what, what will happen is you get out on those corners, and, and you'll get a lot of different things. I'm going to talk about some of that in, in my message this morning, but... Uh, and then Brother Dave gave me an article about Dr. Ruttman, uh, and I mean, it, it, what has changed over the years is uh, you look at a lot of our churches. Uh, at one time, our churches, like the church down here on the corner, was built for Sunday schools uh, because they had sun, so many people coming to church, and they had so many different Sunday school classes. Well, they've lost all that, so now uh, we're at a place in time where uh, the world's just falling apart right before your eyeballs. And, and you're not going to get that kind of thing anymore. But in the day where he's preaching, I mean, these big, massive churches, I've been into some of them where they were huge, man. They looked like football stadiums. And they, they had the crowds. Uh, and it wasn't the crowds. It was the morals of the people. The people wanted the gospel preached at them. And anymore, I remember when I was a kid growing up and uh, going into an old-time tent meeting. I've been into some tent meetings around in the last years or so. They weren't like it was when I was a kid. Man, when I was a kid, man, there were some hellfire-breathing preachers, man, out there. I mean, you talking about a sawdust trail? It was sawdust. They'd bring the sawdust in, and they'd have these tents up and put them in a field somewhere. And it was just an amazing thing, and, and everything's gone. We, we try to mimic sometimes what they did back then. you got to find a new way to do some things sometimes. Uh, uh, this, this, school, this church over here cannot fill those Sunday school classes. Never will fill those classes again. Uh, it's not that I'm negative, it's just that I think that time, that window has gone, and now we're in another realm of stuff. Take your Bibles, go to Genesis. It's an amazing thing what we're in, it, we're, it's a, it, and it hasn't really changed down through history. If you look down through history, it's always changed, things change. David came in, David got the kingdom, uh, uh, Saul lost it, uh, David picked it up, uh, David had to wait for Saul. There's, there's so many lessons in your Bible when it comes to authority leadership, following the chain of command. People say, well, I don't want, then, then, then you don't want to do what God wants to do anyways. But if you want to do what God wants to do, you're going to have to learn that there's a way to do it, that God said do it, and you got to do it his way. There isn't any other way to do it. I wish there was another. Well, I don't even wish there was another way. Any other way would be wrong. Amen. His way is always right. So you need to come to your mind and you come to a place in your life and you sit down and say, God is always right. I had a guy call me last night. And he, he asked me some things, and I'll probably mention it again in the morning service, but he, had, he I said, he, he started talking, and I'm like, he's from Montana or something. And I'm like, he goes, you said something in one of your messages. I'm like, who are you? And he goes, he told me his name. I said, oh, okay, so now I know your name. He goes, what do you think about the book of Enoch? I said, I don't. And he goes, why? I said, because I got 66 books. And I said, there are enough in those 66 books to keep me busy for the rest of my life. I don't need the book of Enoch. And he goes, well, how about the 30 missing books out of the Old Testament? I said, I have a problem with the 39 that's in there. I said, that's where I have my problem. 
and I said, sir, I said, you know what happens is you, 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 you got a Bible sitting in front of you, and you don't want to study this thing, which the Bible itself says, study show that self approved unto God. It's talking about this thing. You don't want to study this thing. You want all this other stuff to click. That's what happened. You know what a lot of people do? They click. They just shut you down. They don't want to hear what you got to say. Uh, really, it's not for me to say anything in it. You got a Bible. Take your Bibles. Go to Genesis 32. I didn't get very far last time. Verse 7. But we're going to get past verse 7 today, I promise you. Then Jacob was greatly afraid. Jacob comes back from Laban after being gone 20 years. Uh, it's an amazing thing what your mind can do to you after 20 years. Uh, with no Today, I mean, we got these stupid things. Jacob would have been talking to Laban or to uh, Esau probably 100 times. Esau, are you still mad at me? No, you're, uh, and send him little smiley faces and stuff. You know, I mean, send him little. <laughs> I, can see, I can see what Jacob would be doing with this thing if he'd had it back then. But no communications for 20 years. Uh, his, Deborah, Deborah came, Deborah's, uh, I think Deborah was the nurse, uh, Rachel's nurse. Uh, and Rachel, Rachel, Rebecca, Rebecca's nurse. And she came back somewhere in that 20-year period. Rebecca sent her nurse back to da uh, Jacob. And she died back on the way. So he had some communications of what was going on there. But that was about it. It says, then Jacob was greatly afraid. Well, he comes back across the mountainside there. And he hears that 400, uh, Esau's coming with 400 of his men. And he divided the people that was with him and the flocks and herds and camels and two, into two bands. And, and said, if, if Esau came to the, company, to the one company and smite it, then the other company which is left shall escape. So now Jacob is making a, a, a calculated risk here, a calculated determinant. He's, he's determining what he's going to do. He's taking a chance here. And he said, uh, I, I'm going to divide these people up into groups. And if these get killed, so he's willing to sacrifice part of his family. I'm not willing to sacrifice anything I got uh, unless the Lord wants me to sacrifice it. If he wants me to sacrifice it, hey, have at it, man. Uh, me and him's talked a long time ago. I'm all for whatever he does, uh, whether it's to me or my family. You say, well, that's me. No, he's always right. Remember I told you about the always right thing? He's always right. I don't have to understand what he does. There's where I think a lot of us get into, into problems. Why does he do? It's, it's none of my concern why he does what he does. Unless he chooses to reveal that to me. If he doesn't, you know, my job, I'm a servant. I'm just supposed to follow the last order I received and keep on moving. Uh, Jacob, Jacob comes across and he said of Esau. So Jacob refers back to, he just got done talking Back in verse 1, he says, uh, verse 1, And Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. How, how oh, brother, if you ever read your Bible, all you need is the book of Genesis. Uh, the guy said, uh, the 30 lost books. But, brother, you got the book of Genesis. If you could just read the book of Genesis, the first 12 chapters, you got the whole thing. If, if you could get all through 50 chapters and study Genesis your whole life, you would understand the nature of man. You'd understand that your nature. You'd understand everything about everything you need to understand. And you could find Jesus Christ in all this stuff. And Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. He's having a conf confrontation or a, a conference call face-to-face. -face. It ain't no uh, uh, yipe or none of this other stuff, whatever all that stuff is. It is a face-to-face. -face. It's not a Zoom. I mean, it's face-to-face. -face. He's meeting some angels, and they're talking to him. Then Jacob saw them. He said, uh, the, uh, this is God's host. So He's taught, and then he immediately reverts right back to his old nature. That's us. Uh, I don't know about you, but sometimes it's really hard to stop and say, okay, Lord. Uh, I like when the Lord throws stuff in your past so fast that you can't keep up with what he's doing, that you don't have time to worry about what all this other stuff is. Uh, that apartment over there was a blessing in a sense, and Mike and Ruth did it to us. So there, it's their fault if y'all want to blame anybody. But it, it's thrown us into a, a frenzy, really, in a sense, to get some things done quickly. And then we got a revival coming up uh, mid-May and then another one in June. And uh, then I'm trying to get another one in August, if I can still get that one on the books. And I'm sitting there going, all this stuff, and then we got camp, and then we got this, we got that. And then you, you still got street preaching coming up. You got jail ministries. You got a few other. There's a lot of little things going on that if you, if the, if you got involved, you wouldn't have time to get in trouble. You just wouldn't have time. Uh, Brother Jerry uh, you, and, and Sandy do the books. They do enough. We, we spend enough money that uh, it keeps them always trying to figure out how in the world are we going to keep up with this, 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 and keep it down to the penny. If you do what God has set in front of you, 
you will find that you have got no time to do anything else. If, if you're trying to find out what you're trying to do, what somebody else is doing, you're missing the whole thing. What does God want you to do? That's the key. What does he want you to do? Jacob refers back to his old nature, tries to come up with a plan to minimize his losses. <laughs> That's us, man. I'm, oh, I, I, you know what you should do? I'll tell you what he should have done. But he didn't. God gave us the story. This is what it is. He should have got down on his knees right here and said, Lord, what do I do? I'm in a mess. No matter, And he should have had all of his kids there, all of his wives there, everything sitting there. And he should have just got down on his knees and said, okay, guys, let's pray. And let's get this thing, get some direction from God what to do. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. When you don't know what to do, the best thing to do is pray. Don't do nothing. Pray. People say, well, if you don't know what to do, don't do nothing. Ah, that, you're just sitting there doing nothing then. S okay, don't do anything but pray and then get some direction. He didn't have any direction. His direction is the old man. Uh, the old man and the new man is right here in, in Jacob, and uh, Jacob's got two parts to him. He's, uh, the Lord's going to call him Israel, and the Lord's going to call him Jacob. He's got two parts to him, just like you and me. Uh, upon hearing the bad news uh, down in 6 that there's 400 men coming, there is not a sign of continuing instant in prayer. Well, I'd have, I'd have hit the floor right there. If I knew I couldn't win, I'd have hit the floor. There, I mean, what are you going to do? You can't win. Nehemiah is probably one of the best. Go to Nehemiah chapter 1. I like Nehemiah. Nehemiah is, is a cool guy. You ever read your Bible? I'm telling you, man, it's a weird book. Why would you need the book of Enoch? I told this guy last night, I said, uh, I said if you go to Colossians, the book of Laodicea and submission, and we don't have that either. Oh, he goes off. And I said, look, I said, there's all kinds of things we don't have. I said, I said, and, I, and then, then it really got right down to it. It got down to a lack of trust and faith. I said, let me ask you a question. Can God direct a man to do the right thing and the man do the right thing? Oh, uh, well, no, the man. I said, no, 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 stop. Can God, you're, then you're limiting God. I believe God took 54 guys, and those 54 guys took all the stuff that God told Tyndale to do and Wycliffe to do, and the Bishop's Bible, Great Bible, uh, Geneva Bible, Gutenberg, all the other people, everybody print, printing all this other stuff. I think God took and said, hey, I want you in the beginning was the word, John chapter 1. I want you to write in the beginning was the word, and they wrote that. In the beginning, God, Genesis 1, in the beginning, God. I think God was very cautious in what he said. Uh, he directed men, and they wrote as they were told to write. They did exactly what they were told to do. You have a book sitting in your hand right now that is a legal document that you can take before God Almighty and say, here's what your word said. And he'll say, yeah, but you didn't do it. And he'll show you where you didn't do it. You, but you'll have a legal document sitting in heaven, on a, probably on a platform. Uh, I, doubt, I doubt if, oh, man, I heard this guy preaching yesterday. I wanted to throw up. He said, okay, turn your Bibles or your, or your, uh, your uh, phone app or this or that. I'm like, what? I said, I couldn't believe it. I said, what happened to flipping the pages in a book, man? Uh, uh, I've seen people preach before, and their faces glow in the pulpit. And you know what is sad about that? Is I've seen another guy who was backslidden as a dog walk up to me and say, oh, did you see? And he was, he was mocking him. Did you see God? They were glowing like Moses. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking, what, what happened to our Bible, man? What happened? Anyways, back to this. I'm, I'm digressing. There is not a sign of continuing instant prayer. Back to Nehemiah. Nehemiah, please, Nehemiah chapter 1. If you've ever read your Bible, you know right where I'm going, so it's a good, it's a good passage. Nehemiah, Nehemiah listens to a problem. Uh, he hears what's going on. He starts in verse 5, chapter 1, verse 5. And said, I beseech thee, O Lord, God of heaven, uh, the great and terrible God, that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let, let thine ear be, now be attentive and thine eyes open, that thou may uh, hear us the prayer of thy servant. So he puts himself in the right place, uh, which I pray before thee now, uh, uh, day and night, for the children of Israel, because he's praying not for himself but for others also, uh, for the children of Israel, thy servant, servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned, including him into that thing against thee, both I and my fathers. And he goes on and starts doing that stuff. And down in verse 11, at the very end, he goes, I pray thee, thy servant, I pray thee, thy servant this day, 
and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. Now, he was going to go in front of the king. You do that, and, and you come in with a sad countenance. They're going to think you just put something in that cup, and you're trying to kill me, and you're toast. Uh, Nehemiah was a different thing. His testimony mattered. Uh, the king had seen him over the years. The king even said this, and he came in there, and, and it says, verse 2, Wherefore the king said unto him, Why is thy countenance sad, uh, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing uh, else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid. Now the king is going to say, What's up? And the king said, Let the king, and, and he said, Let the king live forever. Why should? And he starts asking, and he says, Verse 4, So I prayed to the God of heaven. Nehemiah did it exactly right. Uh, if, if we're sitting there and we say we trust God, and we seek God, and we know God, and we want God, and, and never ask God, don't you think something's wrong? And then we ask, and I don't get what I want. I mean, I pull up to the, the window and say, I want a Whopper with cheese. I don't, do you ever, I, I go to McDonald's, and I, I say, I just want an Egg McMuffin, no cheese. I never get an Egg McMuffin, no cheese. It's all got, always got cheese on it. Then I got to go back inside and tell them I wanted no cheese. What part of no cheese do you not see? But then I got to stop to go do that. Is it worth it? No, I can just roll the window down and throw the cheese out. Because I know it's going to be cold and the cheese aren't melted yet, so I don't have to worry about that. But I'm sitting there going, that's me. I want. I want it my way. You don't hear from God. You want it your way. You're not willing to wait. I see God's hand all over the place. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you this right now. I'll, I'll watch, and I'll show you this will happen, too. You watch, this will happen. The guy next to my house is sell, has a piece of property, and he is not very energetic at all, at, and, uh, to say the least. And I've been trying to figure out a way. The house is caving in. The, barn, the garage is already caved in. And that house is sitting there, and that property is there. And I've been thinking. I said, Lord, for the last three or four weeks, I said, Lord, I need to go talk to this guy. I need to go talk to this guy. I need to go talk to this guy. Have you all ever done it and never did it? That, you know, I need to go talk to this guy. 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 Me and Beth's pulling in the driveway about three weeks into this thing. And she goes, and the little thing's up on our mailbox. And I'm like, what, what's the thing up on our mailbox? She goes, I, I didn't even ask her, I don't think. She said, oh, I, I got some uh, mail in the box there for Gary. I'm like, what? She goes, yeah, all the mail in the box is for Gary. They delivered it to the wrong box. And it was like Lord saying, okay, stupid, now's the time. You won't do it on your own. I'm going to make a way for you to go. Get the mail Take it to Gary. Give him the mail and ask him to sell you that house. So I go over there. I hand him the thing. I give him the mail. I say, hey, you interested? Say, well, I don't really, really want to deal with this right now. Okay, fine. You know what I just did? Put a bug in his ear and walked away. You know what the Lord's going to do? He's going to give me that piece of property. If, if, if I'm supposed to have it. If I'm not, I don't have to worry about a thing. You know what, the, what I'm looking at is the Lord is sitting there. It wouldn't surprise me one bit in a week or two or a month, I get a call. Are you willing to wait a week or two or a month? That I get a call from Gary said, hey, Mike, you want this property? This is what I want for it. And it'll be a price that's reasonable, and I would, it, whatever the market price is, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't. But you say, what is that? That's God setting some things up in a pattern. And things are happening the same way it's always happened for 43 years. And I'm sitting there watching the thing. And I'm like, Lord, this is, a, this is your MOS. This, you always do it this way. And I said, you start the process. All I got to do is wait. We are in a society where we can't wait. That's where Jacob is. We're no different than Jacob. This book was written in 1739 B.C. That's the date on Jacob here. We're 2000 A.D. That's 3,700 years ago. The man's doing the same thing we do today. We do the same exact thing, exactly as Jacob did. Uh, there is only, he's, there's, he's, uh, he's structuralizing, he's programming, he's coordinating of areas. He's doing whatever he can do. The carnal Christian always are hatching some plan. That tells you how carnal, that's carnal is meat. Uh, chili con carne. Dr. Robin, you say that all the time. Chili con carne. Uh, I don't know why he did the chili con carne thing, but he always did. He always said it's carnal. It's meat, meat, beans and meat, 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 meat. You got to have meat. Uh, but he says, you're carnal. He said, we're carnal. Uh, uh, carnal Christians always hatching uh, some plan or program when they ought to be on their knees. We, we that piece of property up there, people say, well, yeah, yeah. That piece of property has been prayed for for 10 years. And the Lord said, you're not ready for it yet. I've been praying for that thing for 10 years. Joe walked up there the other day. I had him look at something and, uh, about a, a, a partition, a wall that we need to put up. 
And Joe even said, he said, brother, you've been praying for this property for years. And the Lord said, okay, now it's time. And, and he dumps it in our hands. You say, what is it? That's God. If you're, not, if you're not ready, if you're not faithful in the least, he won't trust you with much. What we want to do is move to the much before we ever get the least. But the least is what you need so you can get to the place where you trust him along the way to get to the much. It, it's, it's, it isn't for him, it's for us. We got to, God says, don't do this. But Lord, I want to do it. Don't do it. But I want to do it. Don't do it. But I want to do it. He says, get three suits. I don't want to wear a suit. You know how many people down through time has told me you don't have to wear a suit to love God? I'm like, I don't care. Don't get a suit then. I'm going to wear a suit. Why? Because the Lord told me to wear a suit. I said, I'm going to do, but I had to argue with him for three red lights. But I finally gave in. It didn't take me very long to give in at that time. I mean, three red lights, that's about it, man. I'm pulling in. I'm going to get the suits. Uh, do you need to have a suit to serve Jesus Christ? Of course you do not. I've got people in this town say, well, if you go to Mike's church, you got to everybody wear suits. Some of you, Jesse, where's your suit? <laughs> Sis, where's yours at? I don't see you with one on either. No. Uh, it's, it's a crazy thing. Carnal Christians always, they try to hatch some plan. Instead of letting God do it. Uh, I never hatched a plan. I just thought I would sit on my couch and do not. I like to be a couch potato myself. Uh, I think that's a good way to go in and out of this world is to be a couch potato. However, he gave me this other little thing in my life that I can't hardly stand to see something not done. Uh, so I have to get up off the couch and, and do something. So he, I, I thought this church would fail years ago, years ago. I didn't think it would ever get out of my garage, but it did twice. Uh, and uh, then I tell you what, he let us come out of there into the Grange down there. And uh, I didn't like that place at all, man. I'm like, I hate, uh, you know what I learned right there? He was teaching me something. You rent something, and that's the worst thing you'll ever do. Because you'll never have control of what you got. And you're always under the gun of them people to do what. So they rented it to us uh, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. We couldn't use the kitchen. We couldn't do this. We couldn't do that. And uh, we did that for a couple months or however long we did it. I said, that's stupid, man. I said, we had better luck in my garage. So we went back to the garage, and then... The guys we were leaving, the Grange, told me about this place. And I told him he was nuts. I said, you're crazy. I said, I don't want I came over and looked. And all I seen was that garage over there that we now own. And the parking lot all busted up in little bitty pieces of blacktop this big. And a sign out there that you put the little numbers in. And I said, the only good thing about this whole place is the sign. I didn't see this down here. But I seen that up there. And I just, I chunked it, man. I said, forget it. And I drove away. Then the woman out gave us me. Two months later, drives by, there's a note on the sign out there. I told you the only thing good was the sign. It said, we've moved. Beth goes, you need to go look at that place again. I said, I ain't going to go look at it. You need to go look at it. I ain't going to go look at it. It's stupid. I've already been there, done that, got the tea. I don't want. I said, yes, dear. So I come over to look at it, see this, and I'm walking around this thing, and the Lord starts talking to me as I'm walking around it. And you say, What's the, what is it? He provides when he wants to. He, he was teaching me that, hey, this is what happens if you rent. You don't need that. I said, okay, get back in your garage. Now go over here and buy the thing. I said, well, I ain't got no money. He says, you got a house, put it up for a second, put a second mortgage on your house. I said, okay, I can do that. Beth probably thought I was crazy, but I did it anyways. And I come up with some money, and I come into the church in my garage and say, hey, guys, I got this much money, but I need this much. And two men stood up and put the other, the other. I had a third. Each one of them put up a third, and we came up with $200,000 sitting in a garage with 35 people. Like that. I mean like that. Like that. It's always been that way. You know what prayer does? You say, why are you? That's what prayer does. Without prayer, you don't get nowhere. People say, well, I don't see you on your knees all the time. I tell you, man, I'm praying just about 24-7. When I'm awake, I'm like, oh, Lord, I'm a mess. What do I do? What do I do? And I'm driving down the road thinking, Lord, uh, if, if praying is, if the only time you pray is on your knees, you're missing a lot of, you're wasting time. You got time all day long as you're thinking, why are you thinking about something, other stupid game or something? Why not just keep the conversation on God? Lord, show me. I mean, my mind goes off. I, I, I tell you, I, I have to admit, I, I play solitaire, but it's going away. Why? Because they show advertisements. And there's this advertisement of this, this, this thing for weddings, and they show these two stinking queers on there, uh, kissing face, man. I said, okay, Microsoft games go away, man. Exactly. I mean, it's gone. It's gone. I said, the Lord says it's time to let this thing go. You, you've done it enough. It's gone. So I'm going to delete it off my computer, and it's gone. You say, why would you do that? 
because the world is starting to infiltrate everything we do. And if you don't think these games and stuff that they have out there, that they're, it's, it's getting your mind. It's taking your life bit by bit. Anybody in here that's honest would say you sit down, except unless you're really into what you're doing, uh, you can spend hours doing anything. I used to work on electronics. You know what electronics did? It took my job. It took my life. And I thought it was perfect. I said to her, I've never seen anybody that could hold a cigarette in his mouth and sit there and work like this with the eyes shut because the smoke coming up the cigarette into my eyeball. And I had to close my eye and hold my head like this while I'm working inside with equipment and not even moving and sitting there looking out of one eye and, and I'm sitting there because I can't see out the other one and I'm sitting there fixing stuff and the ash, the, I burned the whole cigarette up and never took a puff. And uh, if somebody says something, I shake my head and the whole ash fall into the equipment. And I never clean it out because I don't clean it. If you see my garages, you'll know exactly how I am. <laughs> where it falls, it stays, man. I mean, it's just where it is. Senior Chief Frank called me up here, Elliot, get up here to radio. And he walked me over to this, and he pulled a piece of gear out. And there's this ash just long in there. And he goes, you're the only one that could do that. And he knew exactly who it was. <laughs> it was you know what that was? That was my mind focused on so deep into what I was doing. I didn't care about nothing else. We do that same thing today with games and all that other stuff. It, it, is, it consumes your life. It gives you no time to even think about God. Abraham is a perfect example. You say, oh, well, go back to Abraham. And Abraham was up there on the side of the mountain. Lot was in the city. Which one did better? Abraham did, obviously. God came up and sit down and had, when was the last time the Lord ever come and had lunch with you? I've had lunch. You ever bow your head and pray and he's sitting right there with you? Sitting across the table from you, talking to you. Not, I mean, not. <laughs> my mom still. <laughs> Y'all pray for my mom. I don't know what to do. We're going to take her back to Kentucky Monday or Tuesday. Uh, they kicked her out over there uh, because she started heading out the door in her wheelchair. She was going to go back to Kentucky in her wheelchair. And one of the rules of that, it's not a lockdown facility. So they call her, they classified her as a wanderer. So they sent her to the hospital, and they checked her all out, and there's nothing uh, physical that would cause that. So it's a mental thing. She, her mind is starting to go. But uh, she swears up and down that Reba and uh, Brooke Garth, is, or Garth Brooks or whatever his name is, has been in her room for the last two or three nights. To the point, she actually called the nurse's station to come down here and ask him to leave so she could get some sleep. Uh, the other guy, she watches the Cowboy Channel. I, I, this is not funny, funny, but it is funny. I mean, it's 91 years old. I mean, she's getting them 91. I mean, it's, she had a long life. But uh, the Cowboy Channel, the, the guy on the TV is always looking at her and winking at her and stuff. And I'm like, Mom, you're seeing this stuff. It's amazing how we see things and we don't realize that that's the world. You, you, you invest so much time in this world that that's all you have. Abraham's up on the side of the mountain, and all he has is God. The world will suck you up. And when it gets done with you, it, it will leave absolutely nothing but just a lump of flesh. When the Lord gets done with you, I mean, you will have something where he'll come up with a couple of angels standing there and you'll have lunch with him. I'm telling you, man, I, I like being around. I like the Lord being around. I don't, like, I don't like him not being around. I want him to be around. I need him around. I cannot survive without him around. I cannot do it. Uh, I don't want to be a carnal Christian, although I'm carnal in some areas. I don't want to be carnal all the way. Uh, Jacob is sitting here now, and, and he's, he's worried. He's divided everything up. And, and uh, Peter, Peter was afraid of the Mount of Trig I mean, Peter's up on a mountain. He did the same thing. You go back in your Bible down there. Uh, here's the Lord appears. Moses and Elijah appears with, with the Lord there, and they're all talking about what's getting ready to happen. And it stands, instead of saying, man, this thing is bigger than what I'm thinking, he's thinking, well, we need to build a tabernacle. We need to build something to worship them here. And, and the Lord says, you're an idiot, man. Don't you say, it's, I'm not the God of the dead. I'm the God of the living. Isaac, uh, Abraham, and, uh, or Moses and Elijah are alive. Do you not see them alive? And one of these days you're going to die and you're going to be like, guess what? One of these days you're going to die and you're going to be alive. You're going to be really alive one of these days. And you're going to sit there and think about, what did I waste my whole life doing whatever I'm doing? Uh, I tell the Lord all the time, I, I said, Lord, did I ever do enough? I still don't think I've done enough. I've had preachers tell me, Mike, you're trying to kill yourself. Uh, yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, but I don't have time to do what he wants me to do. I think he wants me to do. I, I need more time. I need like 10 of me uh, just to do the basic things so that you could help your. I think a pastor ought to have a, a, uh, a, a farm, a pen, for better words. I mean, y'all are sheep, so you have a, a, a sheep pen or a sheep cot. 
you ought to have one that's, that you're taking care of your sheep in. I am so sick of seeing these churches out here who don't do anything. And they, every dime goes out, and they let their sheep suffer. I ain't going to do that, man. That, that ain't going to happen. If you, don't, if you think that's wrong, y'all can fire me and get somebody else in here to, to gut the church and do whatever you want. But, but uh, uh, I, I don't think you should have a, a building program, but you should, you, should, you should take care of things. Peter had the right thought. It's just the wrong thing. Jacob believes in God, in God, help those who help themselves. So he's going to do it himself. And he just talked to God. Uh, brother, if you ever get a hold of God, what, what you just did is you opened that door between you and him. Never forget that. Never forget that that door was open. And that you opened it once, you can open it again. And if you really try hard, you can keep that door open. And that thing is coming through with prayer. I've been passing those books out on prayer, Ian Bounds. I got about four more. If anybody wants one, uh, let me know. If you'll read it, I'll give you one. It won't cost you a dime. Uh, it'll change your life. If you read that book and do what it says, it will change your life. Uh, you will no longer have to make up your mind about what you want to do. There's all kinds of things I want to do in life. There's all kinds of things. I drive down the road, I'll see stuff. I want a 62 Chevy. Two -tone. Let me rephrase that. Don't anybody in here, if you find one, buy it. I, I don't want it. But my flesh wants a 62, 63, 64, or 65 Chevy 2 Nova SS that I can give me a 327 three-speed drop down in it and have a nice car. And then I think about that thing. And I'm like, Lord, I ain't got the time for that piece of junk. Even if it's completely redone, I don't have a time for it. I, I have very little time as it is right now. I don't have time for that. Uh, the flesh, you got to get to a place in your life where you'll let go of some of that stuff. And, and you, if you have additional time that you can do whatever you want, then maybe you ought to think about what else you can do. There's street preaching. There's going to jails. There's doing all this other stuff, man. That you, there's ministries that you can be involved in because one of these days, you and I are going to pass away, pass on, and you're going to be standing in front of the Lord Jesus Christ giving an account of yourself. And Jacob, verse 9. And Jacob said, oh, my, oh, God. Now he's starting to get there. Oh, God of my father Abraham. He's done, done everything in the flesh, and he's come to the realization that that ain't going to work. And he goes, and, and Jacob said, verse 9, 32, 9, oh, God, I'm going to finish these, ten, these three, four verses up. Oh, God of my father Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, and the Lord was set us unto me. So he brings Abraham into the picture, his, his lineage. Abraham, Isaac, and the Lord which said us unto me, Return unto thy country and to thy kindred, and I will deal with thee. He is now taking God at his word. Deliver me. He said, I am worthy. I am not worthy of the least of all thy mercies. People get up, upset when you tell them how bad they are. And of all thy truths, of the truths which thou hast showed unto thy servant, for with my staff I have passed over this Jordan and now become two bands. He's saying, look, look what I've done. Have you ever done that where you stopped and said, Lord, you just seen what I did? What Jacob did is he did some stuff out of fear. Then he, he regathered himself and got his composure back, and he realized what he just did. Deliver me, verse 11, I pray thee from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he come and smite me and the mother with the children. And now, that, now he's starting to pray for his family. And, and thou saidest, I will surely do good. And make thy seed as the sea, sand of the sea, uh, which cannot, uh, cannot be numbered for multitude. Jacob now starts to pray. He's now getting a hold. Real prayer starts with a real God. Jacob is now talking to God. Uh, Jacob is, is now going to do something that's going to change the path of his life. And the Lord took some time, 20 years to getting there. Uh, we don't have to waste 20 years. You can get it a lot quicker if you listen. Uh, you don't have to waste 20 years. I mean, it, it's, all you got to do is just start, what you need to do is just start saying stuff. Sometimes you just say it out loud. And then you watch the outcome happen. And then you go, that had to be the Lord. That had to be him. And you say, but that was a little thing. That's fine. But then you, next time you say something else, and you'll see something else happen. And pretty soon you'll start thinking in your mind, your mind will start saying, there is something supernaturally happening here. I cannot show this to anybody. I really wish I could. I tell the Lord that all the time. If I could take my salvation and give it away, I would give it away like that. Why? Because I'd get it back just like that. I know exactly how to do it. <laughs> it worked the first time. It'll work the second time. It'll work the third. But you can't do it. It don't work that way. He gave it to me one time. It's done. I got it. It's over. 
I, I am sealed until the day of redemption. I know it. I, I know exactly where it. I drop dead. I'm going to stand before Jesus Christ like that, absent from the body, present with the Lord. I'm going to be right with him momentarily the moment I quit, take my last breath. Uh, I have no fear of that. Now, when you see me die, I may be crying and begging and all this other stuff. I don't know exactly what's going to happen because I've never died before. But when I die, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm ready to go, man. I'm ready to go. Jacob, that because that's a real God. That's 43 years of dealing with a real God. That is 43 years dealing with the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that has changed my life, man. He's, I'm not even the same as I used to be. I, I'm, I'm not, I am still in the flesh. I still think like I was a kid on that back porch when I was 22. Actually, when I was 16, all the way back through there, I still think that way, but I, I now have something to help me fight that thing. Jacob said, oh, God of my father. He claims the promises. You ever claim the promises? Standing on the promises. Hey, man, we got a song. You ever do that? I, I did this in the church one time. They got all mad at me. I mean, they, people get mad, man. I mean, it just I don't know why they get mad. They just do. But do you, do? You, uh, yeah, 175. Should have just asked Amy. She probably know right off the top of her head. Uh, standing on the promises. Standing on the promises of Christ my King. Do you have any promises? Through eternal ages, let his praises ring. Do you, do you tell everybody what the promises that he gave you? Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing. You know why you don't shout and sing? You don't stand on the promise. Standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail. He said, he said, you ever read these songs when you sing them? Do you take them to heart? I just think they're right, man. I, I don't know what else to do. I mean, I don't know what else to do with them. Uh, when the howling uh, storms of doubt and fear assail. I mean, when, when the world falls apart, I mean, the Lord will bring things back in my mind when I was a little kid riding down the road in the thunderstorm and I was on my bike and, and all of a sudden uh, I, I couldn't see no more because it was raining so hard. I mean, it was raining cats and dogs, not really cats and dogs, but it was raining. And I had I, I stopped on Maryville Drive, and, and my bike fell over, and I'm sitting there crying. You said, Mike, you would cry? Yeah, I was crying back then, man, but I was a little wimp then, too. Uh, and this lady came and got me and brought me up to her porch, and I sit up on that porch with her until the storm passed over. And, and then I get back on my bike and take off again. And I'm sitting there going, Lord, uh, he goes, Mike, you remember some, you had some doubt and some fears, and suddenly here you are. By the living word of God, uh, I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ my, uh, the Lord. Do you have any promises from the Lord? Jacob is talking about his promises. This song wasn't written till somewhere between 19, uh, 1849 and 1928. This, this person has uh, some promises they're standing on. They're writing about them. Standing on the promises of Christ my Lord, bound to him eternally by love's strong cord. I couldn't get away if I wanted. I was born again. There's an umbilical cord that hasn't been cut yet. It'll never be cut. It's an uncuttable umbilical cord. Uh, overcoming daily with the spirit sword. That means sanctification, daily sanctification. Standing on the promise. And finally, he says, standing on the promises, I cannot fail. You know why we fall and don't get back up? It's because we, I didn't say you wouldn't fall. It said you won't fail. The end of that thing means you're going to succeed. Listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Every moment. Resting in my Savior as my all in all. Standing on the promises of God. You got any promises? Man, I got some promises. He said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. Man, when I get into trouble, my mind starts shifting. I'm like, wait a minute. You said you'd never leave. I'm like Jacob, man. Where'd you learn that, reading Jacob? Hey, man, if you can, if Abraham can claim those things and Moses can claim those things and Jacob can claim those things and messes he up, mess up as he is, why can't I claim those things? Why is he any different? Than, as a matter of fact, I'm better than they are because I'm saved, secured, and on my way to heaven. They weren't. I have, I have more right to claim what he said than anybody else. I'm telling you, it's a great thing. He real prayer starts with a real God, but you know that takes time. Jacob's going to live a long time, and he's going to learn a lot of things still. He's still got a lot of things to learn. A real prayer starts with a correct assessment of yourself. You've got to look at yourself, examine yourself whether you're being the faith. You've got to examine yourself. You've got to look at yourself, be honest. I'm honest with myself all the time. I'm a mess. I'm a mess. You can come up to me and say, well, Mike, you are the, and I was like, yep, you're absolutely right. You're, I'm a mess. I'm a mess. I'm working on it. He's still working on me uh, <laughs> to make me what I ought to be. <laughs> 
what gets me is it took him just a week to make the moon and the stars. And, and I've been doing this for 47, 30, 43 years, and I'm still not there. Uh, it's amazing. Real prayer must trust in the only, oh, amen, brother, amen. <laughs> and the Lord never stops that. That's how much he loves you. Do you know how valuable your free will is? Because when, when you do what you're supposed to do, you're giving him the ability to, to, to punch Satan right in the snout. Because you, Satan goes, like Job. Job's a perfect example. He goes, look, at you consider my servant Job? You said, well, Job's no match for the devil. You got it, man. The devil, the devil just stomp all over Job. He did. But, he, but the Lord put a limit on him as far as he could go. And he did that thing, and Job never failed. I mean, Job's trying to survive. You ever put yourself, I've heard people cut Job down all over the place. Have you ever tried to do what Job did? Go through what that guy just went through. He lost 10 of his kids. He lost everything he had. Boils all over. You ever had a boil? I've had one, man. I've had two, and they don't feel good at all. I can't even imagine a whole body full of them. And then your wife telling you to curse God and die on top of that. And then your three friends come up, and they tell you all this negative stuff, too. I mean, pretty soon, you're, you're just like, the whole world's against me. I've got to survive. I'm, I'm right with Job on that stuff, man. But he, he, that guy got to a place where he trusted God, and he took a correct, he finally got to a correct assessment of himself when he was face to face with God. When, you know what prayer does? It puts you face to face to God. And when you get there, man, I'm telling all about it, things change. Real prayer must trust in the only one that can answer and not oneself. That's why he tells you all through the Bible, thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's a, that's a commandment. Why? Because they're, they're dead. They're not real. They're not even dead. They never were alive to be dead. They de never existed. That's just something in man's fabrication in this world. So you know what man has done? Man has showed that all these other things, I like there's a story where uh, Rabshakeh comes to uh, Hezekiah. And Rabshakeh says, God sent me, I'm the God, I've, I've done defeated all these, yeah, you defeated all the gods that don't exist. You know what the world sees? All these gods that don't exist, and they, then they sit there and say, there is no God. You never met the right one. Right. I'm telling you, there's one there in that whole group that's real. And the Lord says, come unto me, all you that are heavy laden. He said, come unto me. Come unto me. Me, 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 me. No, we won't do it. So we, we look at this other thing and say, oh, it's fake. It's fake. It's phony. No, no, you're looking at all these other religions that are fake and phony. I did the same thing, but I stopped. 22 years old, I said, no, wait a second. If you're in that sky, if you're there, you don't think prayer works? If you're there, you better show me. Now, you can say he could hit you with a lightning bolt. Sure, you could. I bet you he's laughing. I bet you the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, Michael, Gabriel, about 100 million angels were up there laughing. Look at that kid on the back porch. Look at him talk to you. <laughs> he doesn't even know. He, he said, be ye holy for I am holy. He don't even know what holy is. The idiot, the moron, and he's, Lord, just let me go down there and smack him. Just let me smack him. No. Watch him. Let's watch him. And he just sits there and watches. You think that really? I think that really happened. I think he was looking down there and he seen somebody cry out. Because they knew that this, if you think this world is normal, you are sick. You need a psychiatrist. You need a whole army of psychiatrists. Real prayer will be honest. That's honest. I was honest in 1980, and I'm honest today. That's real prayer. you got to have an assessment of who you are. You are nothing. I'm nothing. I have nothing. Forget you guys. I am nothing. Real prayer begins with what God said. Deliver me. He said right here. I'm well, the honest. He said, deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother. For, uh, from Esau, for I fear him. You gotta, you gotta take your fears before God and say, "Look, I'm not you, Lord. I'm, I'm scared." Lest He will come and smite me and the mother with His children. Real prayer begins with what God said and not what I think. You gotta get over that thing. What I think, it has nothing to do with it. You gotta get over emotions. Emotions are the worst thing you can ever have. Emotions are good. You need emotions. You don't need to be stone faced. This. But you gotta, you gotta. Emotions have to be held in a place where uh, you can control those things. Because if you ever let them get out of hand, they will destroy you. He claims the Abrahamic blessing uh, received by Abraham at the sacrifice of Isaac. Abraham emotionally was drawn to his son, but he he overcame that by the power of prayer and God in his life. And the Lord said, "Take your son." I'm, I'm sure Abraham did not want to take his son up inside that mountain. I'm sure that Abraham wasn't like, ooh, yeah, let's go, man. Hey, sorry, Isaac. Nah, today's not your day. It's not going to be a good day for you. But I'm going to go serve God. No, no, that's not, I don't think that was the way Abraham was. I think Abraham really was hurting when he did that thing. And uh, he took it up there, and, 
And Jacob knew that. Let me ask you a question. Does your kids, you got kids? Does your kids know your, your salvation experience? Does your kids know any of the points in life where the Lord has done something for you that was, what, was supernatural? Does your kids ever hear you talk about Jesus Christ like he is the king of kings and lord of lords of your life? Jacob's got that. He says, hey, I'm telling you, the God of Abraham, you, and the God of Isaac, yeah, th those are my fathers, and you were their God, and you're my God, and that's what Jacob's doing. You know where he got that? He got it from his grandpa and his dad. That's what he, you don't ever hear him say, well, my mom told me to lie. <laughs> Is that okay? No, you don't hear none of this. You don't hear him say Rebecca anywhere. You know what he's doing? He's sitting there, he's, he's now on praying ground, right there, man. He's right there where he needs to be. And thou saidest, I will surely do thee good. He said, I will take care of you. You know, if God tells you, now he didn't say it's going to be perfect. And he didn't say everything's going to be fine. And he didn't say everything's going to be smooth sailing. He never said that. Uh, I love the Navy. You hear me talk, but there's, there's a lot of times out there, man, I was seasick. I wasn't seasick. I was nauseated about 90% of the time. Uh, I mean, it's miserable out in the middle of the ocean. And you forget all that. You know, it, it's amazing how you forget it when you really do. When you do what you think you should do, it's amazing how you forget all the bad stuff. Uh, I thought, beyond a shadow of a doubt, I should be in the Navy. I thought that. I'm going to be in the Navy. I need to be in the Navy. I love the Navy. I got out of the Navy. I have to get back to the Navy. I forgot everything that went on in that ship for three years, except for like the 10% that was good. The other 90% was terrible. And I signed that paper to join back up like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> and they put me back in boot camp. I'm like, oh, what did I do again? I did it again. <laughs> I said, how did I do that again? And I got back. But you know what? I forgot all the bad stuff. You know, in your Christian walk, there's a lot of bad stuff that happens. That isn't always the greatest stuff in the whole wide world. But you tend to forget that stuff most of the time when you start thinking on Jesus Christ because of the greatness of him and the glory that he has and all the blessings. One little bitty promise that he's kept for me kind of outshines all the bad stuff that ever happened. But I could sit there and look at uh, that car that uh, the guy hit me and, and busted. And I was lost as a goose, man. And he totaled my car out. And, and I had just asked for that a couple seconds ago. And the Lord gave me that. And then I can say, well, hey, I sit on the back porch and ask him to save my soul. And he did. And I asked for this and he did. And I asked for that and he did. And I did. All those little things down through there. And a lot of them are little. But those things outshine all the bad stuff. And you never, I never even think about the bad stuff. Jacob said, he starts getting, Jacob now starts to pray. Are you praying? If you want to really get to the place in, in life where you need to be, prayer is the answer. If you got a salvation is that you prayed to get saved, don't you think you need to pray to keep going on with him for the rest of the time? Father, thank you for your blessings. Bless the morning service. We'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.